My father says, I wrote my first poem when I was five. Our family dog, Biff, had just ran away. Biff was special. He was the first to bust out from our backyard fence and the first to never come back. In the midst of my confusion and my sister's sadness, I ran to my room and pulled out a crayon and a piece of paper. My first poem was only one line, Biff is gone. That one line became a part of what poet Carolyn Forche calls the poetry of witness a poetics that asks readers, at bare minimum, to recognize that which happened. Power and privilege make it possible for us to do the opposite, to dismiss someone else's experience, to make them feel invisible. But when we choose to acknowledge someone else's lived and heavy moments, we hold a powerful space for them to truly feel seen. I'm not advocating that everyone drop what they're doing to become poets. I'm simply suggesting that we all have the presence of mind to become someone else's witness. I was fortunate enough to witness my great-grandmother, to have her around well into my 20s. Jessie, Maria de Jesus, or Nana as I called her, was a tough cookie. But she and I had a special relationship. I felt super important around her. When I was a young boy, we used to sit at her kitchen table, and while she peeled oranges for us, she would tell me all about her life. The orange rinds became a spritz of citrus, the perfume to her stories. In 1918, when Nana was just eight years old, her mother died of the Spanish influenza. Months later, her father remarried and then wound up dying of the same virus. Within one year, the two people who could validate her life were gone. Nana and her siblings were left with a woman who would not acknowledge them. She used to tell me with a tight lip how she was left to care for her younger brother who wound up dying of gangrene before he even had teeth. I never said much. I just watched and nodded and listened. In the backdrop of Nana's childhood was the upheaval of revolution in Mexico. So much of her childhood was lost. Her immigration story began at a train station in Aguascalientes. With still most of her baby teeth in her mouth, she and her sister were sent across the border to live with a distant relative in El Paso. By the time she was 14 years old, she had hopped on another train, this time headed for Los Angeles. Nana arrived in downtown LA in 1924, a teenager in the roaring 20s. It wasn't long after that a cultural validation came when at a very young age, she married my great-grandfather. Their violence, their alcohol abuse, and their eventual divorce nearly drowned the two of them. In the end, Nana lived to be 98 years old. She was a fighter. And by that, I mean that she fought with most people in her life. One day, while she violently resisted the help of four nurses, I walked into her hospital room, and we locked eyes. I remember taking a deep breath and feeling curious while a calming familiarity fell over her. We didn't use words, but it was as though we were transported back to her kitchen table. In that moment, the nurses recognized and seized the moment itself to work as quickly as possible and my Nana remained still and calm through it all. That day in her hospital room, I stood there bearing witness to her suffering, her confusion. I didn't rescue her from anything, but I held the space for her to be acknowledged. I believe we can heal our family wounds this way, 
with acknowledgement and validation. Doctors Karen Hall and Melissa Cook in their book, The Power of Validation, define it as the recognition and acceptance that someone has thoughts and feelings that are true and real to them, regardless of logic or whether it makes sense to anyone else. Cada mente es un mundo, my father says. If that's true, if every mind is a world all its own, then our experiences vary and validation matters. In their book, Hall and Cook talk about six levels of validation. But I'm only going to emphasize one for you today. The first level, and in my opinion the most important, goes back to being present. The next time you are confronted with a story of pain or suffering, I invite you to hold space, to breathe deeply, and to stay there. To really be a witness to someone else's experience without minimizing it or trying to find an immediate fix. What if everyone here today realized the healing power that you have simply by standing next to someone when they are hurting? It isn't always easy, but the world needs that kind of healing right now. My Nana's healing came through her storytelling. I'd like to share a poem with you that I wrote from snippets of her life. It's called Getting Here. I was chiquita cuando my parents died. We must have been rico. I remember servants and a big house. I remember a little brother, pero I can't remember su nombre. There was a war going on or something. Era just me and my sis, so we fed our little brother bread. That's all there was. Pero él no tenía teeth. And the pan, well, era tan hard, he began to bleed. Pobrecito. My sis and I, fuimos con otros familiares. A tío or somebody took us to live in El Paso. See these teeth? They're American. They were born here. Sabes que, I can't even remember what my parents look like. And I haven't been back to Mexico since. Tampoco sé what it looks like now. My father se llamaba Valentin. I must have been 14 por ahí cuando I hopped another train. Los Angeles was different then, you know. My sis and I worked at a sewing factory right there off uh, Broadway. ¿Cómo se llama? Ah, I forget. Look at my fingers. Mira. Some weekends, my sis and I used to go hop a red car. Around then, Doña Barbara was on the big screen. We used to go. We used to watch Esas Mujeres in black and white. That's how I learned how to paint my lips red, watching those women in the movies. There can be no healing if someone's experience is ignored or dismissed. My ask today is that we begin to hold more space for each other and to bear witness to each other's stories. Thank you.